I'm going to trip you up a little bit. We're not going to start in Galatians today. But we haven't left Galatians. I want to be sure that you're mindful of that. We will continue in Galatians in the weeks ahead. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to turn instead to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 3, verse 21 through 26. Now we know this chapter, at least we think we do. There's one verse that we quote all the time out of chapter 3, and that's verse 23. But interestingly enough, when we quote it, we often do so out of its context. For all of sin is short of the glory of God. But what's interesting about it is that we leave out the best all of all. And that's the all are atoned. That's gorgeous. All sins have been atoned for. We're going, to look, we're going to look at atonement today. We're going to look at even more than that, but this is really going to be part of our focus. Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 21. And now, everybody say now. 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 Yes. A righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known. To which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Now, I want to, you to see something here in verse 22. I want you to see a pair of bookends. On the one side that we just read is the bookend of faith. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. The righteousness which has been provided and available to all is not automatic. It is intended for all who believe. Notice he says, there's no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And are justified freely by His grace. By His grace. Remember, we're doing a series on grace. Through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Now God presented Him as a sacrifice of atonement. Through faith. Now here's the other book in it. Through faith. In his blood. Now the question comes though, what if you don't have faith? Uh -huh. Then what happens to atonement then? Well, we, we're not going to talk about that so much. There's a lot of theology we can get into. There's a lot of difference of opinions we can get into. Uh, there, there's so much that we could discuss about this, but we're not going to do that, okay? For one thing, I don't want to create any controversy and I don't want to create any confusion about the atonement of God. But what we need to get, notice again in verse 25. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice. Because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand 
unpunished. In other words, it kind of seemed like for a while that God wasn't just. It seemed like for a while that the guilty were going unpunished. Hey, wait a minute. Doesn't it kind of seem like that now? Doesn't it seem like evil men are growing worse and worse and that the guilty, a lot of them in Washington, D.C., are going unpunished? Verse 26. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present, side, present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have, notice again that term, who have faith in Jesus. So who, who, who are justified? Those who have faith in Jesus. Whose sins are atoned for? Those who have faith in Jesus. Who, have, who experiences redemption? Those who have faith in Jesus. Who has the righteousness of God? Those who have faith in Jesus. Okay? May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Listen, no message have, has blessed me more than this series on grace. Now, I'm not saying it's the best preaching I've ever done, but I will simply say, and this is not for me at all, but this is, this is to God. This is by far the best series I've ever been allowed or given by God to preach. We talk about God's amazing grace, His abundant grace. But you know, ladies and gentlemen, we don't really know what grace is. And if anything, this has enlarged my own personal understanding, my own awareness of the grace of God, just not, in, not only in my own salvation, but in all of life. Every moment that you and I have is by His grace. Every breath, every heartbeat, every thought, every feeling, every experience that we have in life is by His grace. Where would we be without the grace of God? The word appears 124 times in the word of God. Eight times in our study of Galatians. But I come to Romans because it appears 18 times in the book of Romans. You know, they call Galatians Romans light. So let's, let's, let's quit the light this morning. Let's go to the, let's go to the full thing. Let's, let's go full strength here. 18 times in the book of Romans. Now, Galatians was Paul's first letter. And Romans was written some five to six years later, near the end of his third missionary journey out of Corinth. In all of his travels, he covered over 10,000 miles, mostly by foot. 10,000 miles. And in that time, he was hounded. He was rejected and he was persecuted. The Bible says this, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. What's he saying? I was whipped nearly 200 times. 195 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Oh, by the way, and he was left for dead. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night, I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. While many of us who call ourselves Christians today are looking for safe spaces. <clears throat> I have labored and toiled and often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. 
who is weak and I do not feel weak. Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24 through 30. Yet in spite of all this, Paul proclaims the grace of God. In Galatians chapter 1 verse 6, we talked about how we are called to live in the grace of Christ. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 21, he says, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, then Christ died for nothing. It defines why and how we live. Yes, how we are saved, but even more, how we are to live. And that's by grace. Husbands, treat your wives with grace. Wives, treat your husbands with grace. Treat your children with grace. Treat your parents with grace. Your grandchildren with grace. Strangers with grace. I asked you last week, well, you know, wouldn't it, or whatever it was, what a different world would it be if everybody lived by grace? Over the last two weeks, we talked about the God of grace, the gift of grace, the gospel of grace. And by the way, he said there, if it's not the gospel of grace, it's no gospel at all. The glory of grace, God's glory and our future glory, all by grace. I'm going to talk about future glory here in a little bit. And then we came to the R's last week. Righteousness, which came by grace. Redemption, the price paid by grace. Reconciliation, relationships healed by grace or restored. And there's another R. Reception, our receiving of God's grace. And how do we do that? Well, I'll give you an example. Brother Keith, would you come here, son? it up here so it's on the camera. Okay. There you go. I have a gift for you. Okay. It's it's grace. You don't deserve this. You can't earn it. It's grace. And it's yours. Okay. Like that. Well you will? When did that become yours? When God gave it to me. When He gave it to you, or when you accepted it? There you are. You received it, right? Yes. Now, what's inside? Uh, forgiveness. Forgiveness. Huh. Of every sin? Yes. Wow. Salvation. Salvation. Awesome. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Wow. And eternal life. Eternal life. And there are many other things. That could be in that box, right? Yes. We've mentioned a bunch of them. Righteousness, redemption, reconciliation, reward, so much. But anyway, now, take the grace of God with you and share it with others. The grace of God is yours but only when you receive it and my question is have you received God's 
grace. Are we ready to live by grace? Now we come to part three. We've looked at the G's, we've looked at the R's, now let's look at the A's and maybe God willing the C's, okay, of God's grace. A number one, atonement. It's in our text. Verse 24 and 25 of Romans chapter 3. We're justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented Him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in His blood. Verse 25. Now, does anybody have a King James translation for verse 25. New King James. Close enough. <laughs> Says, God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God has passed over the sins that were previously committed. Interesting the King James uses a different word. The King James does not have the word atonement. It has the word propitiation. Now. <laughs> and my footnote has an interesting, I've never seen before. Go ahead. Sure. For propitiation, uh -huh. the cross reference is mercy seat. Mercy seat. Why is that? Because I'm, I'm about to show you why that is. What's very interesting in, in your Bible, and no matter what translation it is, even if it translates the word atonement, there is no good Greek word for atonement. Why? Because it's not a Greek idea. The Greeks don't have a, really a word for it. Now they have the word sacrifice. They have the word propitiation, which is the offering or the sacrifice but not the purpose of the sacrifice. As a matter of fact, the word atonement is a Hebrew word. It appears only in the Old Testament. Now, it'll appear in English in some of your Bibles, but if you count them, there's not that many references in the New Testament because, again, it's a Hebrew word, not a Greek word. It appears 89 times in the Old Testament, and it's the Hebrew word kafar. And kafar refers to the mercy seat that covered the Ark of the Covenant. That box wherein was the Ten Commandments and Aaron's rod and uh, a jar of manna, okay? You might remember that stuff was in there. That, that important? Not really. But anyways, the mercy seat, once a year, once a year the high priest, after, after a cleanse, being cleansed of his own sins through sacrifice, would take the, gather the blood of the sacrificed lamb in a bowl, take it into, behind the curtain, into the most holy place, the Holy of Holies, and pour out the blood on top of the mercy seat. And that mercy seat was the chafar, or the atonement. The blood covered the cover, okay? And, every, and then once a year, this is observed once a year, not anymore because there's no more temple. There's no more temple. There's no more sacrifice. And Jesus, by the way, has fulfilled that. Jesus himself has poured out his blood and has brought the atonement. Look at verse 25 again. God presented him, presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. There you are. So there are two ideas as to what atonement is or what the blood does. One, it covers. Now, it's not like we think of when we think of cover. Some people want to cover up their sin. You know, they want to hide it. The purpose of the blood of Jesus is not to hide your sins. It's not like sweeping dirt under a rug. But the word here, the idea of the word here is reparations, to pay for, uh, to cover the charge, 
if you will. Not to hide it, but to cover it. In other words, it's kind of like when, some, when we say to somebody, hey man, I got you covered. God is saying to me and God is saying to you, I got you covered. The other idea behind the word of atonement is the word purity. Because not only does it cover, it cleanses. And they poured the blood out on the mercy seat. So there's a lot of idea about atonement. And a lot of people, there's a lot of confusion about the idea of atonement. Limited atonement, unlimited atonement, all that kind of stuff. We're not going to get into that. But understand that propitiation, which is used here, refers to the means. Atonement refers to the act or the purpose. And specifically, he mentions it here in verse 25 as a sacrifice of, of atonement through faith in his blood. The blood. The grace of God provided the blood that atones for our sin. Now, how is that, how does that work? How does one have their sins atoned for? The blood. You are, you, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have the blood of Christ covering you. You can plead the blood of Jesus. Okay? But what if you're not? What if you do not have faith as we look at these bookends in this passage? What if you are not a believer? What if you're not? Where's the atonement? Are you covered? You could be. You could be. But you're not. Some scriptures that will go along with this idea. First John, by the way, the screen, it says John 21. There should be a colon here. So say 1 John 2, chapter 2, 1 through 2. I'm make that, I'm sorry I made that mistake. But 1 John chapter 2, 1 and 2. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one. If anybody does sin, yep, we do. We have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice. And again, the idea is propitiation. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So yes, his blood is enough. His blood, because of the grace of God, his blood is enough to cover all sins. But unfortunately, as we demonstrated to you a while ago, all do not receive it. Does that, does that clarify some understanding? God's atonement is not limited in scope. But unfortunately, it is limited to the elect. Those who come to faith in Jesus Christ. Now, I've tried to make that plain, and I hope it's plain enough. Ephesians chapter 1, 6 and 7 says this. Be sure I'm reading the right verse here. Or did I even have that one? Hmm. Look behind me. Oh, it's up behind me. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, here we go. To the praise of his glorious grace. Yes, there's another one we could have used that which he has freely given us in the one he loves. And in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. So there you are. Ooh, we could have talked about riches as an R, couldn't we? There's just so many wonderful things and so much depth about the grace of God. But Hebrews chapter 9, 22 and 14, you probably have those ready too. Anyway, it says this. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness, no atonement. How much more, then, will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God? 
Hallelujah. The grace of God, you see, not only gives you forgiveness from your sins, but enables you to live a life cleansed of sin that you and I might bring glory to God with our life. So it is grace. What a wonderful gift. So we've looked at the first A, atonement. The second A, acceptance. Acceptance. Grace is God's acceptance of us through faith. Not law, not merit. You remember the, the listen, one of the greatest verses in the Bible. It says, Abraham believed God. Abraham believed God, and he was called a friend of God. And it says, God counted it as righteousness. Romans 5, 1 and 2 puts it this way. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access. Access. We've been accepted, but all that we've gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Wow. Good stuff. Good stuff. But how about this? Ephesians 1. 3 through 6. Let's go back to verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. What does it say? It says He blessed us with every spiritual blessing. And then it says He chose us. He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. It says in love He predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Notice those phrases. He blessed us. He chose us. He predestined us. His glorious grace, which he's freely given us to the one he loves. Let me make this clear. It's not because of us. It's because of Christ. It's because of Christ. That's the grace of God. Ephesians 2, 4 through 7, shares a little more light on it, saying this that because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised it. Listen, it's by grace you've been saved, not by your will. Not by anything you did. Not because you're better than somebody else or whatever. No, 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 no. It's by grace you've been saved. Even when you were dead in transgressions. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages He might show the incomparable riches of His grace. In other words, God's not finished, folks. He's just getting started. Are you getting this? Are you getting this? God's grace is... Yeah. I would have to say it's pretty inexhaustible here. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable, that's the word, incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Access. Acceptance. Here's a great one for access. Hebrews 4.16 Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We have access to the throne of God. Again, it's not because of us. It's because of Christ. That's grace, ladies and gentlemen. Look, look. Damon back there. Damon in the control booth. Hello, Damon. Look. I am no more worthy of salvation than Damon. Damon is saved by grace. Amen. And everything that good that God has for him is by grace. It's nothing about Damon. Although we love him. He's a pretty cool guy. But no. 
It's by grace. That's, that's why we've got to stop putting each other above somebody else. That's why we don't play favorites. The Bible says God is God doesn't play favorites. And we shouldn't either. Acceptance. We need to learn to accept people by grace, regardless of their race, which I think is a bogus word in the first place. Regardless of their, their ethnicity, their language, uh, their culture, whatever else it might be about them. Yes, even their sins. We don't have to accept their sinfulness. But we need to learn to accept them the way God accepted us, and that's by grace. Adrian Rogers says grace, place, or don't be proud of your race, your place, or your. Oh, I just lost the drift of that. Because it's all by grace. <laughs> Amen. It's all by grace. When you, when, when, when you remember it. Yeah, it's not your face, it's not your place, it's not your race. It's all by grace, right? Is that what you're trying to say? Something like that. Something like that. All right, good. Number three, adoption. A stands for adoption. This is Ephesians 1 again. We could have, we could have gone to Ephesians. Ephesians 1, 5 and 6. He predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. To the praise of His glorious grace, which He's freely given us in the one He loves. Did you know that in Paul's day, and I know you've probably heard this before, but did you know in Paul's day you could disown a natural born child? But you could not disown an adopted child. Because one was because of natural birth, the other one because of law, because of an oath, because of a covenant because of a choice that was made. Adoption was an act of God's grace. We've been adopted. Galatians 4, 4 through 6, we often think of that as a, a Christmas passage, going back to Galatians, of course. But when the time had fully come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. And because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out Abba, Father. In other words, what did we get for Christmas? What is one of the gifts of Christmas grace? We got a Father. We got a Father. No, listen to this, there are no illegitimate children in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. How does one become a child of God though? Well, it's not religion. It's not works. It's not birth. Be being a creation of God does not make one a child of God. We hear people say all the time, we are all God's children. No, we're not. Did you know at one point Jesus said, you are of your father the devil. For he was a liar and a murderer. And uh, at one time, yes, we were all children of Satan. But how does one become a child of God? The Bible makes it clear. John chapter 1, 11 through 13. This, of course, John chapter 1 is uh, the Apostle John's Christmas story. And in verses 11 through 13, he says, He came to that which was his own. But his own did not receive him. Yet, to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of a human decision, or even a husband's will, but born of God. Jesus said to Nicodemus, I say to you, you must be born again. And that is how one becomes a child of God. Romans 8, 16, the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Galatians 3, 26, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. 1 John 3, 1 and 2, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when He appears, 
We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We will recognize our Father, and we will be recognized by our Father. Amen? Amen. That's good stuff, ain't it? That's grace. Grace. We have all kinds of songs about grace. Abundant grace. We're going to talk a little bit more about the abundance next week when we talk about another aspect of God's grace, beginning with the letter E. But abundant grace, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. By the way, if you're not familiar with 2 Corinthians chapter 9, you need to read it because it will answer all the questions you have about giving. Whether you're giving to church or giving to others, stewardship. If you any question you got about giving, it will be answered to you in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. But in verse 8 it says this, And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things at all times having all that you need you will abound in every good work now when does he do that he does that when you learn the grace of giving when you and I become students of the grace of giving you know that old saying you can't out give God you can't and this is, this is testimony to that in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. We'll read it again. But it's abundant grace. It's enough. I, I said I'm already jumping ahead. One of the E's of God's grace is that God's grace is enough. Amen? All right, now, let's, let's, let's look at one more A, simple, with no points here, really. Amazing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind. Now I see. It's amazing. It's, it's amazing. Not that God, that Jesus died for the sins of the world. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. What, but what's truly amazing is that he died for me. What's really amazing is that he died for you. What's really amazing is that he can give you faith to trust him. And as a result of that faith, you become his child. And you can live a life of grace, filled with grace, abundant grace, amazing grace. Now let's move to the C's quickly. These will go quickly. Not going to spend a lot of time on this. First C, Christmas. Without grace, there would be no Christmas. Very simple. We're calling this message, after all, Christmas grace. But what's also interesting about that is the word is not found in Scripture. Christmas, as we know it, is not in the Bible. It's an invention. It's a celebration of the birth of Christ. The birth of Christ is an historical event. The birth of Christ is biblical. But the way we celebrate it, Christmas, the Christ Mass. Okay? But we know Christmas celebrates the advent, the first coming of Christ. Galatians 4, 4 again. Like I said, it's, it's the Christmas verse in the book of Galatians says, but when the time had fully come, God sent His Son. That's the first advent. And then, number seven, the next scene, we have the Christ of Christmas. He is the agent of God's grace. There would be no hope, no salvation without Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, and the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Without his death and resurrection, there would be no grace. We preached from uh, Galatians 2, 21 last week. And again, that verse, Galatians 2, 21, says this, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. But listen to this. Not only by his death, but also by his resurrection. Without his resurrection, there would be no grace. Now, this is where I'm going to end the message. Everybody turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It also, I'm sure, because of the hard work that's being done in the back, it might be on the screen as well. That's okay if it's not. But understand the resurrection... The resurrection is what really is, 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 it's really what makes grace possible. Look at verse 1, 1 through 3. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 3. Now, brothers, 
I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you. Now the gospel he preached to them was the gospel of grace. He makes that clear in Galatians and everywhere else in his letters. The gospel of grace. I want to remind you of the gospel of grace which I preached to you, which you received. Yes, which you received, Keith. Yes. Yes. And on which you have taken your stand by this gospel of grace. I know I keep adding those words. But that's what it is. You are saved. And if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as the first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And I left out verse 4. That he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. I can't believe I left out that verse. But look at verse, skip on down to verses 19 and 20. If only for this life we have hope in Christ. We are to be pitied more than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. So the Christ of Christmas delivered us God's grace and secured it by his resurrection. And then finally we come to the last scene. And that's the second coming of Christ. You see, grace not only applies to this life, but grace also applies to the life that we have yet to experience. The life that is to come. The life you have not lived. The life that will come at your and my resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 through 26. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ will all be made alive. Hallelujah. That's his grace. But in each his own turn. Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Now you understand when Christ rose the first time, or when, he, when Christ rose, I'm sorry, when Christ rose, there were others that rose. Those that were in the graves came out and appeared to many. That's the first fruits. Okay? Did you know that there was a whole bunch of holidays that came together during that springtime? There was what was called um, Passover, and Christ was crucified on Passover. And then when he rose again, that was the day of first fruits. He became the first fruit, the first one of those who slept to rise again. And many appeared, many came out of the graves and appeared to be in the city. That's the first fruit. So let's go back to that verse. That is, if I can remember where it's at. Okay, here it is. But each in his own turn, Christ, the first fruits, then, when he comes, those who belong to him, I ask you this question, do you belong to him? Then, the end will come. When he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he's destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he's put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And then, listen, verse 51. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Notice the power of sin is the law, but grace has a greater power. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully in the work of the Lord. Listen, don't give yourself halfway. Don't be lazy. Don't be lackadaisical when it comes to living your life for Christ. And that includes this church thing. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Ladies and gentlemen, that is grace. Let me ask you this question. Are you ready for the next installment? Of God's grace. Are you ready not only for righteousness and redemption and 
justification and all those atonement and all those other things. But are you ready for glorification? Christmas came. And God's grace came with it. His grace continues day by day and for all eternity. But the question remains, do you know the grace of God? And God's people said, Amen. 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 Let's stand together.